Okay, so if you've been following the Linux news recently, you'd have seen this term pop up occasionally, x86-64v3. The question is, uh, what is it? Why does it matter to Linux? And what is all the fuss about? So if you want to find out more, please let me explain. Okay, so let's go back 39 or so years to the Intel 80386, the 386 for short. It really was a turning point for modern desktop and server computing. So it was released in 1985 and it was Intel's first 32-bit processor and it included a full memory management unit, which means it could run OSs that use virtual memory. If you wanna know more about virtual memory, then I do have a video here on this channel. What is virtual memory, MMU, page tables, and more? I highly recommend, of course I do, that you check out that video. However, things didn't stop uh, just with the x86 as defined by the Intel 386. There's always been more progression, things have changed. Um, and as the time has gone past, this older chip and its micro architecture and the instructions it had have kind of been dropped. So Debian Linux dropped 386 support in 2005, completely removed it in 2007. And the Linux kernel itself dropped support in uh, 2012, even though Linux was originally actually developed on 386 and 486 machines. Now, after the 386 came the 486, the 586, the 686, and, and so on. For naming purposes, they got called the Pentium, Pent for 5, 586, and Pentium 2, and so on, because you can't copyright a number. So that's why that didn't happen. Uh, and each new version added more instructions to the x86 instruction set and introduced new extensions like MMX and SS. E. After a while, the common operating system started to drop support for 32-bit x86 in total. So we moved over into the 64-bit era. And so now Windows 11 is 64-bit only. Ubuntu stopped supporting 32-bit PCs in 2018. Mac OS went fully 64-bit in 2011 and so on. So now we're in the 64-bit era. It doesn't mean that things have stopped. No, no, sir, no, no. Things keep on progressing. And so we now have this definition of an x86-64 uh, processor. And the baseline is an AMD 64, x86-64 processor with MMX, SSE, SSE2, which is basically what was in the 2003 AMD K8 process, the first 64-bit x86 processors, minus the 3D now parts, so that you've basically then got the same compatibility with the first EMT64T, which was Intel's 64-bit processors. And yes, I do know that AMD's processors came out in 64-bit first, and they are the ones that define the x86 64-bit uh, architecture. Now, one step above the baseline AMD K8 is called, and here's where we get this term now, x86 64 v2. And it corresponds to the mainline CPU from around 2008 to 2011. And so that's the different processors there from Intel and from AMD, for example, the AMD Bulldozer. It includes SSE 3. SSE 4.1 and SSE 4.2. As of May 2023, Red Hat dropped a support for older baseline x86-64 processors and now requires support from x86-64 v2 processors. OpenSUSE Tumbleweed also began transitioning to require v2 processors in late 2023. While it currently still targets the baseline ones, developers are aiming to move to v2 in the future. Similarly, uh, SUSE Linux Enterprise Server recommends v2 for optimal performance performance and may drop support for older processors in the future. So what is x86-64 v3, which is what all the kind of the noise has been about, the fuss has been about recently? Well, it basically adds AVX2 and then a couple of more instructions, FMA, move BE, uh, and some additional bit manipulation instructions. AVX2, also known as the Haswell instructions, is an expansion to the original AVX uh, instruction set that was introduced in Intel's Haswell microarchitecture. MoveB instruction is provided for swapping bytes on a read from memory or on a write to memory, thus providing uh, conversion to Little Endian and Big Endian uh, very quickly in hardware. I have videos here on this channel about the difference in Little Endian and Big Endian if that kind of thing interests you. 
and the fused multiply add instruction combines multiplication and addition into a single operation that computes the intermediate result with finite precision. So very, very handy, particularly for, for gaming, for matrix stuff, and of course for neural network stuff. So x86 v3 was implemented in the first uh, Intel Haswell generation CPUs, that's in 2013. AMD implemented it in uh, 2015. But uh, Intel Atom product line only added V3 support with the Grace Mount marker architecture. However, Intel still continue to release Atom CPUs without AVX or AVX2, uh, including the Parker Ridge line uh, and some variants in 2023. So this is why V3 has kind of been slowing becoming a baseline because there's not all Intel processors support it. And so therefore mandating it would be a bit problematic however these are atom processes not server processes but anyway uh, so you're not guaranteed to have particularly to have a v3 you have to check your particular processor and there is also an x86 64 v4 for complete it's also worth mentioning that adds avx uh, 5112 now if you want to test with your cpu has x86 64 in it then you can use this tool called x86 64 level which uh, you can find there in github it's a shell script that basically looks at slash uh, proc slash cpu info and tells you about your cpu or you can run ld linux the linker dynamic linker there minus minus help uh, so for example on ubuntu you'd have to do uh, slash usr slash lib64 ld linux x86 64.so.2 minus minus help okay and then that will give you a listing and here you can see you know it tells you it supports v2 v3 uh, and v4 so why is all the fuss about this well red hat linux uh, enterprise linux 10 will move to the v3 baseline gen 2 is now offering uh, v3 packages uh, there are experimental builds of ubuntu server using uh, v3 this basically means that when they compile it they use the right compiler flags to actually make sure that avx2 uh, can get used when it needs to if there is a way of doing it that way rather than using you know traditional floating point or or whatever or the fma instruction or whatever so when the compiler comes across a particular sequence you can say oh i can do that in hardware using these things but it has to have that hardware support uh, and so that's what's coming out now and what's coming out in these different and i'm sure that lots of other different linux distributions have various statuses on this on what they are supporting uh, nix os for example is transitioning to v2 in 2024 and subsequently to v3 uh, by 2027 now comparing linux distros compiled with baseline or v2 to those with v3 show some cases there is a performance boost and in some cases there is a performance decline so the compilers are doing the best they can at the moment to try to work out which would be the best route to take which instruction sets to use which extensions to use and sometimes they actually turn out to be faster significantly faster uh, and sometimes they're actually a bit slower so this is a maturing technology in terms of the compiler flags and what the code the compiler produces for different use cases however i do want to just underline just because a distro well known or otherwise requires a certain micro architecture level it doesn't mean that linux itself needs it for example you can still get 32-bit linux distributions uh, even today so that's not a problem uh, linux didn't drop it just that particular distro whether it be ubuntu or or, or whatever so uh, you can always find a version of a Linux distribution that suits the particular hardware you've got, particularly if you've got an old PC, 32-bit PC, you know, you can still get them. So don't, that's not a worry. It's about what the leading edge and most popular distros are doing. If the Linux kernel drops support for a certain microarchitecture level, like it did with the 386, that would be a different thing. And we're not at that stage yet. We're talking about what the distros are doing, not the Linux kernel itself. And of course, this is only about a 64-bit x86 processors from Intel or from AMD does which has nothing to do with like for example ARM processors uh, that you might get for example in a Raspberry Pi or in your smartphone and of course Windows 11 itself talking about Windows rather than Linux has already mandated the use of modern CPUs so you've got eighth generation Intel Core or Zen 2 required to officially of course, there are workarounds, yes, but to officially run Windows 11, see my video, you probably won't be able to use Windows 11 for more details about that. 
Okay, that's it. My name's Gary Sims. This is Gary Explains. I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do give it a thumbs up. If you like these kind of videos, then why not stick around by subscribing to the channel? Okay, that's it. I'll see you in the next one.